The biggest show on earth, the Football World Cup is just hours away. Host Qatar will take on Ecuador in the opening match at 9.30 p.m. IST. The opening ceremony starts at 7.30 p.m., marking the start of the first ever World Cup held in the Middle East. Uh, they needed over a decade of preparation and that has led to this point. The Football World Cup in Qatar will likely be the final act on the global stage for numerous players, Argentina's Lionel Messi, Portugal's Cristiano Ronaldo, Croatia's Luka Modric, the list goes on and on. Karim Benzema of France has already been ruled out with an injury. But at this hour, to talk about the preparations and, and the buzz, I am joined by Tracy Holmes, ABC broadcaster. Tracy, thank you very much for talking to us. Now, you have been there on ground for a while and I can see you uh, coming to us from a uh, lovely locale. Tell us what's the buzz there. Well, it really is a buzz. So last night was uh, Saturday night in Doha. They had a fireworks display along the Corniche, which basically is the water walkway that leads from old Doha town into the new CBD. It was packed full of concerts. All the families were out. There was uh, light activity. There was a drone display. And you really started getting the sense that, yes, finally, after 12 years of um, a, a much criticised build-up to this World Cup, it is underway and it will be later on this evening here in Doha. Tracy, as a woman out there uh, and someone, you know, who've, who have been given certain dress, dressing regulations, how, fee, how safe do you feel on the streets of Qatar? Look, I've tried to explain this to many of my colleagues back in Australia. I feel safer on the streets here than I do in Sydney, which is where I live. And it was interesting this morning, I was in the souk, the little marketplace, having breakfast um, with some of the others that are here covering the tournament. And I was talking to a couple of young reporters from China and um, they were saying that they also feel incredibly safe here. You know, the culture of um, a, a real family based culture. There are families everywhere. Uh, and I think this has been part of the debate around the whole alcohol issue, mm -hmm. whether alcohol would be available on the perimeter outside venues. And, uh, you know, they, they brought that rule in only 48 mm -hmm. hours before it started, saying that that would no longer be the case. And I think that has been a real relief for many people um, because they do feel safer mm -hmm. uh, if there's not drunken mobs running around, as we usually see at a FIFA World Cup. Well, uh, that has been a menace in various uh, sporting venues across the globe. Uh, but Tracy, one of the things I heard you say in one of your OBs that you've been hearing Sepp Blatter on mics across Doha saying that uh, the, the fact that World Cup goes to Qatar. And now Sepp Blatter has turned around saying that uh, granting them the World Cup was a mistake. So what's the reaction? What's the response of the Qatari people to that? Look, I think the Qatari people play that grab and it's on a loop with a lot of very funky music behind it and it's Seth Blatter popping in, announcing them as winners. I think they're using that. Um, they know it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but they also know that's the moment when history was made for this country. Uh, since then, there have been many changes at FIFA. Um, since then, they've really had the support of Gianni Infantino, the new president. Uh, but Seth Blatter's reasons for believing that uh, this country was not ready for the World Cup was because... Mm -hmm he said the country is too small and yet the new president Gianni Infantino says that's a real selling point and you would have to say that just the buzz in the streets on the last you know 36 48 hours uh, is that that does provide a buzz because you can go to three or four games in a day that right. has never happened in any World Cup. Mm -hmm. This is probably the shortest since Argentina in 1978. Uh, the entire tournament will be finished in 29 days. But Tracy, you spoke about Infantino. Were you there for Infantino's monologue yesterday defending Qatar? What did you think of it? Look, I wasn't. Uh, I heard a few snippets. I heard the immediate critical reaction to that. I've heard a little bit more. I have a one-hour journey to the opening ceremony later today, and that wow. will give me the one hour I need to hear the, the, <laughs> the speech in full. And it was a monologue. Um, but, you know, in some ways, it's very easy to be critical. And, and I understand some of the comparisons he was making to being teased as a young boy with red hair probably don't cut it with people who have been, you know, really harshly treated as members of the LGBTQI community or, uh, you know, some of the migrant workers. But... I do understand in what he was trying to say with a level of empathy here, 
No World Cup organiser in the history of organising World Cups has come under the sustained scrutiny that this country has. And that does lead to questions as to why it is so. Uh, there have been phenomenal changes here with regard to workers' rights, which are now ground-setting for many people in the region, many other countries in the region. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there is still some way to go. And I think uh, Infantino's message might have got a little bit lost. He's a man that speaks seven or eight languages. Um, but yeah. his message yesterday was a little bit lost. I, I think he was just trying to express the empathy, you know, that um, people have been trying very hard. They're welcoming the world. It's the first World Cup in this region. And in, in some ways, now it's time for that to be celebrated. Tracy, it's very interesting for me to have you on air because you are someone who have covered several Olympic Games, including the Olympics in China, the Winter Olympics earlier this year. Uh, we've heard of several human rights issues, human rights abuse in China and in Qatar. How do you compare these two countries? Um, look, I don't think it's possible, really, to compare one country with another um, because every country comes to the point they're at through their own history, through their own culture, through their own religion or lack of religion, through their own political system. And every single one of those comes again with its own challenges and where they are in their history. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I support human rights for all and, and I believe that it should be an equal and fair planet, but it is not. But how we get to that point where we hope it can be an equal and fair planet um, is up for debate. Uh, I'm also a person that is very familiar um, with our own human rights abuses in the country where I live, you know, the treatment of refugees, the treatment of the Indigenous population with reparations that have not been sufficient uh, for the invasion of their country and us taking their country. Um, and so I'm, I'm very uh, reluctant. Um, of course, I'm, I'm willing to call out human rights abuses when they're seen and they are seen everywhere uh, but i'm reluctant to point fingers at people or countries in a way that assumes i'm coming from a position that is any better um, than the position they're in i'm, I'm much more i suppose uh, of the diplomatic mindset where you need to engage people to try and encourage people to get to a position that is going to make it better for everybody and i think we all sit in that basket Tracy, um, well, let's get to the talk of the day. I have been reading in several websites about uh, Qatar being accused of bribing Ecuador players. $7.4 million to lose the opening match. Eight players have been bribed. That's the talk on the internet. Have you heard about it and what's the reaction on ground? Well, the reaction here has been, of course, you know, an, an official um, declaration that that is just not true and that it is uh, a beat-up, and we've seen plenty of beat-ups with regard to this country. Um, I guess the problem comes when you've had a situation where Qatar has been under scrutiny and under a lot of negativity for 12 years, yet it becomes a situation where nobody knows who to believe. And it's a little bit like what we're seeing in American politics at the moment. If you do it so much and you put out so much fake news and there are so many rumours, in the end you don't know who to trust, Who's telling the truth? Who's got the right story? Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I think we're in that situation here as well. Well, we'll of course wait and see tonight what happens. One final question before I let you go away from the controversies. What are the predictions uh, from about teams making the final four and winning the cup? Well, there's a lot of uh, sentimentality, of course, with France, who are the defending World Cup champions. There's also a lot of people thinking Denmark look extremely good. Brazil are always up there with the favourites. There's a lot of talk about Argentina. And I was talking to a former Socceroo goalkeeper, Mark Schwarzer, who is here covering um, the matches for the BBC today. And he was saying that he thinks Germany is a, a quiet one to watch. He really thinks they have what it takes. They've got good coaching. Uh, they're talented right across the park. They work well together as a team. Uh, so perhaps that's the quiet one to watch come to the boil at the end of the day.